Scott is with us for his uh, Monday morning visit. How are you? Gary, good to talk to you, man. Always uh, good kicking off Mondays with you, my friend. Indeed it is. I just got through asking Rodney about his uh, his take on Charlie Strong uh, coming to Tuscaloosa and visiting with the defensive coaching staff and Nick Saban. And uh, did Rodney uh, ask Rodney if he anticipated a role on the staff? We don't really know yet, but I think there's a possibility that Coach Strong can wind up here as an analyst or who who knows, maybe even an on-the-field position. What uh, what do you think is going to happen, if anything, there with Charlie Strong in Alabama? Well, I, I think that's certainly a possibility as well. I mean, this guy, first of all, has a great defensive mind. He's been around the, the conference. He's, he's been in a, in a very good, prominent role and as a head coach, uh, Probably the most prominent role he had was at Texas. So uh, he is a very good coordinator. Uh, he did a great job when he was at Florida. I know that. I got to know him when he was with the Gators uh, many years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. But uh, he's a he's a very, very good, uh, sound mind. I think he and Coach Saban are very on the same mindset about how you run defense, how you attack on defense, how you disguise coverages and things of that nature. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all if he comes on board uh, in a Butch Jones kind of role and kind of waits for opportunities. Not a lot of opportunities on the staff right now in terms of full-time positions or, or on the field uh, opportunities as a coordinator. And, and those things can certainly change. They're fluid. But I think most of us are all at the same point now that we agree that Pete Golding is probably going to be back as, as it's a coordinator. I, I think that's a good move right now. And uh, because we've talked about continuity in the staff, uh, for well over the last two years, and, and I think continuity is the is the important word here. I also believe that uh, uh, you're going to have a lot of talent, and I think this defense is going to perform a whole lot better this year. Uh, and it amaz- it's amazing when you have a lot of talent that's all that's not hurt or injured, and you got a lot of experience coming back. Uh, what that makes a defensive coordinator eventually look like, right, Gary? <laughs> so I, I think Alabama's in good shape on both sides of the ball going to spring practice. I want to ask you about the state of the program. And, um, you know, Alabama wins national championships, it seems like, about every other year here, but haven't won one now in the last two seasons. Uh, This past year, didn't even win the division, lost to LSU for the first time since 2011. They lost two of the last three to Auburn. You've got uh, A&M on the rise. Certainly Georgia in the east has been knocking on the door. Uh, Florida looks like they're going to pitch. Tennessee's improving. Uh, Ole Miss uh, hires Lane Kiffin in the West. Mississippi State brings in Mike Leach, two high-profile head coaches. Uh, And Alabama, as I said, still having outstanding success, but not quite to the level that uh, we've gotten accustomed to under Nick Saban. Is Alabama still the big dog in this league? LSU's the defending national champion uh, from this conference. Uh, Where do you see Alabama big picture in this conference right now? Well, Alabama's a team to beat. I mean, let's let's be honest. Take take the we can take the crimson colored glasses off, but this uh, this football program has been the most dominant program uh, over the last ten years of any college in the country, and that includes anybody. It certainly has in the SEC, and and uh, yeah, they didn't win the division this year. We've seen this happen before. Uh, had it had, had it happened back in uh, in 2013 and 14. Um, you, you win the division in 14, then you come back and, and uh, you lose a, a, a game to Ole Miss, you lose to Ohio State, and then you come back in 2015, you, you lose to Ole Miss at home again, and everybody's like, wow, the dynasty's really over. And from that point on, it, it was pure dominance from, from 2015 all the way up to this past year. So, uh, you know, a couple of losses last year that could have been wins, that's the thing's gone differently. I think you have to learn from those things, but Alabama's got the the best coaching staff in this league. They got the best head coach in the history of the league, and they are the most talented football team in this league again this year. And Georgia is close. Uh, some other teams are, are knocking on the door, and LSU just lost 16 guys that are major components to a team that won the national title last year in the best school, uh, player in school history. Everything went right for the Tigers. It's going to be a little bit different this year, so. Alabama will be the favorite. They're, they're already, uh, you saw the S&P rankings last weekend uh, that ESPN put out, had Alabama number one based on returning talent and the new people that are coming in. This roster, again, Gary, one through 85, it's the best in all of college football. 
Uh, and then you maybe look at Clemson, maybe you look at Georgia and, and, and Ohio State and people like that. But Alabama's talent will take a back seat to nobody. And the senior leadership that this team's going to have this year, I think it's going to be the best class to, in terms of leadership Alabama's had yeah, going all the way back to 2016 when you had just a truckload of alpha dogs on that team with Eddie Jackson and, and Reuben Foster and Jonathan Allen. This team is going to remind me a lot of that team in, in terms of uh, you know how 2016 was. You had a freshman quarterback at Jalen Hurts, but a ton of talent everywhere, and it played for a national title. I think Alabama is, is going to be in a position again if it takes care of business. Two early season games in September. You know, obviously with the, with USC in Dallas and then Georgia coming to town, Alabama's going to be in the national championship picture. I think a whole lot better than this year because there's not going to be any question about the strength of schedule and, oh, you haven't played anybody. That is not going to be a narrative in 2020. I also discussed this with Rodney, and that is uh, Nick Saban going into his 14th season. Scott? Wow. He got here. I think most Alabama fans were just hoping, you know, minimum of five, maybe yeah. as long as seven or eight, and who knows, ten. And there were constant rumors his first few years that uh, he was going to leave for this job and that job and, you know, whatever job that you could mention. And now he goes into his 14th season. Uh, I, I said earlier, and I wonder if you agree with me, that of all the amazing accomplishments that Nick Saban has had in Alabama, based on his past, never having been at, 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 a, at a school for more, I think, than five years at a, at, a, at a hitch, to be now 14 seasons at Alabama, that's the most amazing accomplishment for me, is that Alabama still has Nick Saban. After hiring him in 2007, they still have him in 2020. You know, it is remarkable, Gary. I, I keep going back to that conversation you and I had in the hallway uh, over at uh, the TV station back in 06. I know you remember Alabama was getting ready to go play Tennessee in Knoxville, and you and I were just like, hey, if they can just beat Tennessee and then maybe beat Auburn. And then Nick Saban comes to Alabama, and changed, it changed the entire dynamic and everybody's mind. Think, obviously, your mindset changed as well. And I think along the way, that was, that's what happened. I, keep, I think the key word is mindset. I think Nick Saban was uh, – what really he enjoyed was, was the rebuilding of it, kind of like at the gas station, working on cars with his father. You know, they get cars running right and send them back into the world and, okay, let's go do another one. And I think I think with everything that happened in 2011 with the tornado and then the success with the national titles and then the birth of the college football playoff. But I also think the way Nick Saban has been able to recruit at the level he's been able to recruit at the last 14 years, we've never seen a guy do that in the history of college football like he's done. He, he's been able to replenish his roster uh, oh, and he's missed on some players here and there, and every great recruiter will. But he's been able to go out and get the players that he needed to continue what he's trying to build every year. And I think finally, uh, when they won the national title in 2015 with Jake Coker at quarterback and kind of a rebuilt offense and all that with Derrick Henry at tailback and all that, I just think it just really struck a chord with him as, you know what, we can, re we can have a new team every year. We're going to lose 25% of our team. We're going to recruit at a high level. And then the challenge to continue to stay on the mound. I think once Nick Saban, as he mentioned in that documentary of Bill Belichick, once he became a mountain and, and was the guy everybody was trying to chase, I think that became the next challenge for him. How do we stay here? How do we continue the success? How do we be great year in and year out? And just moving around and, and, and changing jobs wasn't going, to do, wasn't going to allow him to, I think, fulfill – uh, his legacy as a coach. And I think him staying and, and building and remaining that mountain as long as he has. Again, Alabama's probably going to go in this year, Gary. And for the 13th consecutive year this season, Alabama's likely going to find itself ranked number one at some point. It certainly will if it's able to win those two games in September. I ask you about Mel Tucker taking the Michigan State job. Uh, leaving Colorado after one season, former uh, Alabama assistant, Georgia assistant, of course, uh, Big Ten guy from way back, played at Wisconsin, had coached at Michigan State before uh, with Nick Saban. But uh, the thing got a little messy there. He had gone out on social media and said he was staying in Boulder, and uh, so often is the case. Uh, Michigan State came back in with a bigger offer. He's you know he's making a 
over five million dollars. I guess you can't blame him, but it brought up the right. uh, subject again about coaches, you know, uh, leaving on contracts with huge buyouts and, and only staying one year, and and players, uh, you know, having not the ability to do that. Although the Big Ten has said they put in want to put in legislation that you could transfer one time without sitting out. But um, what did you think of uh, Michigan State? Had a hard time filling that job. They got a lot going on up there after D'Antonio. Uh, and D'Antonio just kind of stepped down unexpectedly. There's some NCAA rumors. Of course, the gymnastics scandal with Larry Nasser continues to kind of taint that campus. Uh, Mel Tucker to Michigan State, what do you think of that fit? Well, listen, anytime, uh, anytime that you have an opportunity to, to go from one job to a better job, and, and listen, I think most of us would agree, Colorado is uh, – it, they were great in the early 90s you know, when, when Coach McCartney was there and what, what they were able to do. But uh, Michigan State, they, they, they're they the only other Big Ten team that's made the playoff in the, in the playoff era. They, they were very, very good under Martin Antonio. And he did it largely, uh, Gary, by, by not getting even uh, – the team that made it to the – to the playoff in 2015, they were not, they were not even a top 20, they never had a top 20 recruiting class uh, under Martin Antonio. up there. And look at the talent the Spartans sent to the NFL. So that's a good job. Um, it's a place you can win. Uh, it's in a really great conference. And you look at Colorado and, and, and the conference it's in, I think, I think Mel Tucker, when he sat down and looked at all the positives there, plus the money and all that, I know he'd only been there a year. And I think when Mel Tucker was answering the question the other night, I think he was being honest. I think he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm planning on staying. And uh, and then things change. And uh, you hate seeing a coach leave uh, before they get through really one recruiting cycle there. But that, that kind of tells you the respect that Mel Tucker has. And Nick Saban had a lot of great things to say about Mel Tucker, as, as you know, as he was on Alabama staff as a graduate assistant. So, He's very highly thought of out there. And so Michigan State went after their guy. And I think after Luke Fickle turned it down, I think he was the guy they really wanted, uh, an, an Ohio guy, Luke, Luke Fickle. Because um, you gotta, you've got to recruit Ohio uh, if you're going to win in the Big Ten. You have to. And, uh, and Mel Tucker, that's, his, uh, that's where everybody looks at him as a relentless recruiter. And that's kind of the thing that you got to have before your name now Besides offensive guru or defensive guru, you, you got to have a relentless recruiter as part of as part of your mo. That's what he is, and that's why Michigan State went after him. So I don't blame him for taking a job. There's no e- easy way to exit one job to another, uh, especially in college football with the way Twitter is and everything else. So, uh, but I think in the, at the end of the day, I think uh, I think it was a good move for for, for Mel Tucker to get that job. With coaches leaving the way that they do, though, Scott, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the discussion is up again. And as I said, the Big Ten may put in some legislation. Right. A player be allowed to transfer uh, one time without penalty, meaning not having to sit out. And let's be honest, the transfer portal is here to stay. And in often cases, these guys are getting ruled eligible anyway. And if you graduated, then you can you can transfer and uh, and not have to sit out. Or would you be in favor of a new rule that just said, hey, a player – uh, can transfer at least one time without penalty, can transfer no. as an underclassman to another school? No way. Uh, that's that, that, to me, that's sending the wrong message. Um, it, it says that if you compete where you are and, and you don't make the first team or you're not happy with your situation, you can just quit. And I, don't think, I think that's still the wrong thing to everybody out there. I, I think you have to compete. I think that you uh, it, it gives you an opportunity to quit when most people normally would not do. Because, Gary, that's the thing we've been taught all our lives. You can never quit. Now, I don't care what circumstances you're in or how bad things are or whatever it is, whatever you're facing in this world, you can't quit. You can't give in. And this is making it easier to quit, I think, for young people. And it's sending the wrong message. I have, the transfer portal, I have no issue with because most of the people – that are transferring now, most of them are college graduates. They fulfilled what they needed to do in a three, three and a half year period or whatever. And then their situation just doesn't work out. Maybe your coach left or whatever. Uh, I think the, uh, I think the actual process needs to be reviewed. Why some guys get eligible, why some guys don't. Uh, I think there needs to be more legislation there and they need to be more transparent on why, 
why guys are being allowed eligibility and why others aren't that face similar circumstances. But I think if we open up Pandora's box there, you'll have people that really, really would have the opportunity to stay and work and get better and continue the process of where they are. And this make that would just make it easier to say, yeah, I'll just I'm quitting and I, I'm just going to go transfer somewhere else. I don't like it. It sends the wrong message, and that's not what college football or college athletics is about. The easy way out. I don't, I don't like it at all. Before we close out the, <coughs> pardon me. Before we close out the segment, Alabama basketball gets a huge win, 88-82 on on Saturday over uh, LSU. A quad one win. Uh, Herbert Jones, such a big boost to the to the lineup with 17 rebounds, playing basically one handed. Uh, this Alabama basketball team, Scott, can they still can they finish strong enough to uh, to still make it into the NCAA tournament? What do you think? Well, you know, they jumped from a 77 percent chance to a 90 percent chance to make the tournament after that win over LSU. The reason is um, the percentage jumped 82 to 94 percent because. If Bama can get to 18 wins, and you look at the schedule right now, and I think this is a really op- good opportunity, um, 19 wins, I think they're in. And if you can, if Alabama can find five more wins, and you look at the schedule, and, and they've got a difficult schedule. These three road games that they got to go play at Mississippi State, at Ole Miss, and then at Missouri, those are not going to be easy. If you can find a way to steal two of those and then win these games at home and then get to, uh, you know, get to the SEC tournament, with 18 or 19 wins, I think Alabama is going to be a dangerous team in the SEC tournament. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to play them. Herb Jones will be healthy by then. Um, I think you're going to be in really good shape when March. I think his team, uh, when you when you get get them into a tournament setting, I think they're going to be really really uh, difficult to beat. So uh, if if Bama can get to 18 or 19 wins, Gary, and 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 and, and beat Mississippi State beat Missouri and then get get that win over Ole Miss and handle your business at home, I, I think it's going to be really hard to keep this team out. Now, there's also a small margin for error right now. You can't have any margin of error moving forward. So, Bama let a couple slip away at home last week. Um, when you lose to Tennessee and you lose to Arkansas, those were winnable games. But the way they played in the last week against Auburn and the way that they played against LSU, those are two – are the better teams in the country, and the way Alabama played them, uh, you got to give Nate Oates and this team a lot of credit. The effort has been there all year. Uh, I think Alabama will be a tournament team. I think they're going to sneak their way in this thing, but there is no margin of error moving forward, Gary. you got to take care of business. Indeed. All right, Scott, uh, what you got coming up on iTalk SEC Radio and, and uh, fill the listeners in on how they can be a part of it. Yeah, man, we'll we'll be on four to six every day, like we always are, and uh, looking forward to that. I think uh, today we may be carrying the Daytona 500. I gotta get the, uh, uh, I gotta get that uh, and make sure we're sure on that. But uh, yeah, that's going on today, and uh, and then the, a big week of SEC basketball coming up, and and now softball, baseball, everything is uh, is hit its stride now. Bama with three big wins of baseball over the weekend. Uh, softball still struggling. Don't don't worry about softball though, Gary. I think we're all on the same page. Bama softball is going to be fine. That this early season tough schedule they're playing is only going to make this team better. I think Bama's going to be fine in softball. Great stuff, Scott. Appreciate it. Yes, sir, Gary. Always enjoy kicking off Mondays with you, buddy. Thank you, sir.